Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the final official introduction to Linux meeting. So, for the past two meetings, we've been focused mostly on using Linux as the sort of almost in the same way you would use Windows. Mostly with GUI apps, just working with graphical stuff, right? For the final meetup, we'll go into something a little bit more advanced, but also in a lot of ways kind of what makes Linux so powerful, which is going to be the terminal. So now we are going to be working with magic words and magic commands for this meetup. So I have made a cheat sheet of a lot of the stuff I'll be talking today. This will be available, uh, first of all, in the description of the YouTube video. Second of all, I, I don't know if I have a way to send it to you guys. Just go to the YouTube video, download it from there. So, uh, has anyone used commands for other purposes in like, in Windows and stuff, because you can use commands. Anyone else remember using any commands for any reasons? So uh, I guess a, on Windows, a common thing would be to check if your internet is working or something with a ping command. We'll go into that in a second. So since we are on KDE, again, we can just type terminal. And we'll see that the terminal on KDE is called console. Now, thankfully, the screen projector is actually not cut off this time. So you can fully see what's to the left. That's nice. And this is how this looks, right? I will make the text a bit bigger in a second so that you can actually see what's happening. But generally speaking, kind of no matter what operating system you're on, you are going to have some type of a terminal that you can use. And it is generally going to look something like this. So when you open it up, you have what's called, you have what's called the prompt. So going from left to right, is that, yeah, it's going to tell us Yonuts. So Yonuts is my username on this machine. Now, then it's going to go at Yonuts Lenovo V15. This is the name of the actual machine. So it's going to go user at machine. And then importantly, here it's going to tell us what path we are on. And we're going to be talking about paths in a second. This special character here, right, the tilde, this has a special meaning in the terminal, which is that this refers to your home directory. So where we are currently is the same thing as if I open the file explorer, right? So Dolphin. And I would just be in the home directory here. So currently, both the terminal and the file explorer are in the same location, right? Now, in the terminal, the first thing we might want to do is we might want to see what files do we have available at the location where we are, right? If we are in the file explorer, we can just see the files right here. If we are in the terminal, we can just type ls from list, and then it's going to list out all of the files that we have available, and the folders in this case. So if we look on the right side, we notice here, so from here to here, right, the same things. But if we remember, last time when we played a bit with Dolphin, we enabled the ability to see hidden files. And I talked about how on Linux, Hidden files are any files that start with a dot as the first character of the file name. So in Dolphin, we can just go through the menu and we can show hidden files. We can toggle that, basically. If we want to do that in the terminal, we can still type ls and we can give it the option. So options are passed with a sort of a line before them. The option, I believe, a from all. And if we do that, now it's showing us all of the files. And now we can kind of see all of the folders we see on the right side as well, right? So uh, yeah, the only difference is you might notice here on the left, it doesn't do like folders first and then files. I think we can get it to do that. Not exactly sure how. But uh, that's why they're slightly different order, because it starts over here at bash and then so forth, right? Now, the, so the ls commands allows us to see the contents of the current directory that we're in, right? The next thing we might want to do is we might want to move to a new directory. 
So in the file explorer, we will just double click on something. Let's go into our documents, right? And now the documents have opened. Uh, well, the downloads have opened because I clicked on downloads. But if I would click on documents, then the documents would open. So in console, in the terminal, we have a command called cd, change directory. All of the files will have kind of, there'll be shortened versions of what they do. So ls from list, cd from change directory, stuff like that. So now we can change directory into documents, right? And notice how if I start typing something, so let's say I do doc, and then I press tab, that's going to autocomplete. If I just do do and I press tab, then it's not going to do anything unless I press multiple times because it doesn't know what I want it autocompleted with. It could be downloads or it could be documents. But if I give it doc and then I press tab, it's going to do documents. So now, notice how here it says tilde, so we are in the home directory, and inside of it, we are in documents. If we now run the ls command, we will see the same two things we have on the right. We have a secret.txt file and a long secret.txt file, right? So, uh, I will make the text slightly smaller so that it fits on the screen. But let's see, uh, if I do something like this, is this readable? Yeah? Okay, cool. So, uh, we've learned how to go from one directory to the other, right? Now, how do we go back if we want to go to home? Well, one of the things we could do is I said that the tilde character has a special meaning, meaning home. So I could go cd tilde. And that will get me in the same place, in the home directory. And we'll see that now if I ls, we once again get all the folders in my home directory. Alternatively, in any folder that you are, so let's say we go back into downloads, right? If you just want to go to the parent folder, so you want to go one above, you can go cd dot dot. Again, special meaning. That just means go one above. And so if we do this, once again, we are in our home directory, right? Okay, now, we've learned how to move through the folders so we can navigate around a bit. Let's see what we can actually do with files. So let's go back into, no, I don't want to go into downloads. I want to go into documents, okay? Now, in documents, let's do an ls again to see what we have. We have a long secret and we have a secret. We don't know how to open them yet. We'll open them in a second, but they are simple text files. First of all, one of the things we could do in here is if we right click on it, we can do a bunch of stuff like we can copy it, we can cut it, which is basically moving it and stuff, right? So we have commands for that as well. And they're again, short two letters commands because easy to type. So to copy a file, you have the cp command. And you're going to give the file that you want to copy, so secrets.txt, secret.txt, sorry. And let's say I want to copy it into copy of secrets, secret.txt, right? And now you can automatically see on the right side of the screen in the file explorer that it has created the copy of the file. Now, I don't want that copy, so let's delete it. Again, in the File Explorer, you either right-click and go to Delete or just press the Delete key. In here, we have the command rm from Remove. So with rm, we can do rm, copy. Again, I can press Tab to autocomplete. And if I press Enter, on the right side, the file disappeared. Now, the other common operations you would have with files is to, instead of copying them, just move them. So. Let's go one above here, one folder above. And let's say my secret.txt, I want to move it from uh, documents, I want to move it into downloads, for example. So the move commands, the move command is intuitively called MD for move. And then we can move downloads backslash secret, secret.txt. Uh, no, it's not in downloads, sorry. It is in documents, secret.txt. And I want to move it inside of downloads. And now I have to once again give it a name, because I can also rename it here if I want. But let's say for now, I still want to call it secret. So I call it secret.txt. If I run this command, 
you see that the file disappeared on the left side of the screen. But if we go to our home directory and we move into downloads, now it's here. Same way, we can now go move, uh, move from downloads secret, we can move it back into documents secret. Now, I said that the move command also, because of the way it works, we need to type the name of the resulting file that we want as well. So, in the terminal, we don't have like a special command for uh, renaming files. If you want to rename a file, you just move it to the same location, just a different name. So I can say, I can go inside of the doc documents folder. Okay, so now we can see we are in documents. And I can go move secret.txt and let's move it into super secret.txt. And now if you run this, you said the file has basically just been renamed. Because I've just told it to move it into the same place, so I haven't actually moved it. I've just renamed the file. So that's how that works as well. Now, other common operations you would have are, you might want to create a file. Or, even more commonly, you want to create a folder, right? So, let's create a new, let's create a new folder first. So, for that, we have the command mkdir from make directory. So we'll make a directory. It's going to do it inside of where we are right now, so inside of documents. And let's call it meeting tree. And if we run this, a new folder has appeared, meeting tree. And now we can go into that folder if we want. And now we're there. I will once again maybe make this a little bit smaller, not by much. Uh, is it readable? Okay. So, now that I've created this new folder and I'm inside of it, what if I want to create a file? Now, to create a file, we have a command called touch. Why is it called this way? Actually, no idea. But that's just what it's called. This one's the only one that I would personally, at least, not consider particularly intuitive. Everything else so far has been mv from move, mkd from make directory, and then it's touch, I guess. But uh, let's touch a secret.txt. Now, if we go into meeting three, we've created a new file called secret.txt. Though, if we double click it to open inside of Kate, that file is empty. I've just created an empty text file, basically. Now, I think these are mostly all of the like very common, I'll call them file management operations. So you move between folders, you create folders, you create files and you move files and folders around. Now, one, I guess, uh, a couple notes here. What if you want to delete a folder? So let's say I want to delete the meeting tree folder, right? Well, I can do rm meeting tree, as we've done before with like the rm command from remove. But if we run it, it's going to say, cannot remove meeting tree is a directory. So. By default, the rm command, the remove command, will just delete one file. If you tell it to delete a folder, it doesn't really know how to do that, because if you delete a folder, what happens to the files inside of the folder? It would mean it has to delete those as well. So we can tell it to do that. We can say remove meeting tree, and we can give it an option. So let's do it at the end here. We can do a line for an option. I'll make this slightly smaller so that it looks OK. And then I can type R. So R comes from recursive. What that means is delete the folder, then go inside of the folder, delete all of the files inside. If there is a folder inside, delete all of those files. So it just keeps moving down the tree and it deletes everything under that folder. So now if we do this with the R flag, now we delete it. And now we have an error because we were in the folder and it's going to tell us that it's no longer accessible because we deleted it. So it pushed us back to documents. OK? So now that we're done with that, let's actually talk a bit about these text files. Because so far, we haven't really known how to open them. So first of all, if we just want to print the contents of the file to the terminal and just see them in the terminal, 
we can do a cat command. Cat comes from? Uh, concatenate, uh, append, and something else. Yeah, I guess. So it comes from concatenate because it can also be used. Uh, so if you do cat on one file, you'll see that it's going to print it to the terminal. You can also do it on multiple files, and then it's going to concatenate the files, and it's going to print all of them to the terminal. So that's why it's called that way. But if we run it on just one file, so if I do cat on super secret, it's going to print the contents of super secret. So we have our UVTCA flag there. So now that we have that, right? What if we want to open a file that is very, very long? So in this case, I have this long secret here. And if I do a cat on long secret, well, we're now at the end of the file, but we can clearly see there was probably something above it. And now, because we are in a, terminal, in a graphical terminal, we could technically just scroll up until we reach the top, but these terminals have a limit for how much history they keep. So if your file is like a million lines long, your terminal might only keep maybe a thousand lines of history. So you're not going to be able to just scroll up through the entire file. So we have some special utilities for that. In this case, for example, we can use the less command. So less is what you would call a pager, I believe would be the correct term, I guess. And if we run less on the super secret, well, if we do it on the super secret, it's very small, so that doesn't make much sense. But if we run less on the long secret, now we are at the top of the file instead. And we can see that it says scripts.com bmovie by Jerry Seinfeld. So the less command will uh, print the top of the file. And now with our arrow keys, we can go down or up the file, one line at a time. So this is a way of sort of browsing through really long files, right? And now if we want to exit out of this, we can press Q from quit. Now, alternatively, you also have, intuitively, I guess, the more command. So the more command is going to do basically the same thing as we click it. We are once again at the top. The only difference is that now if I press the down arrow key, it goes one entire page at a time instead of going one line at a time. Realistically, they have the same utility, I guess. You just scroll through long files. But less is going to allow you to do it one line at a time. More does it one page at a time. Because it's more than less, I guess. And then less, you can also use the page up, page down keys to go pages. So yeah. you'll mostly use less. Yeah. So I, I wanted to show more because it exists and because it's funny that we have less and we have more. But realistically, more has sort of lost purpose. People don't really use more anymore because you can just use less and the page up, page down stuff. So now another quick command that I don't have on the list, but you're going to see me use it at some point, so I'll go into it really quickly, is the clear command. So the clear command is just going to clear the terminal. This does nothing to your files. It does nothing to anything. It just clears the terminal output so that we have so that we don't have a bunch of text anymore on the screen. OK? So now comes the interesting part. Let's say we want to edit a text file. So obviously, if I just double click on it, it's going to open it in Kate, in the graphical text editor. But let's say I want to edit the text file in the terminal. So first of all, I guess I haven't really talked about this. Why would I want to do any of this in the terminal? Why would I want to move around folders and copy files and edit text files? Why would I do that in the terminal? Why not do it with the GUI? Anyone has an intuition as to maybe why? Well, one of the most important, I guess, reasons I could think of is servers. If you have to work on a server, a lot of servers are not are going to be what's called headless. They don't have a monitor. They don't output anything graphically. 
you just connect to them remotely through the command line. And that's all of the interface you have with the server. You can only communicate through the server using the command line. And so you have to be able to do quite a bit of at least basic stuff with the command line because you're not always going to have a graphical environment that you can work with. So what if I want to edit text files? There's multiple text editors that you can use, similar to how if you want to edit them graphically, on Windows you can do it in Notepad, Notepad++, VS Code, whatever, there's many text editors. It's the same in the command line. In the terminal you have multiple text editors. Now, I'm pretty sure on any distributions you'll have, it will come pre-installed with an editor called Nano. So if I do Nano and then Super Secret, this is the interface that Nano is going to give me. So once again, I see the contents of the file. I, with my arrows, I can move through the file, right? And this is going to work the same way any graphical text editor would work. So I can go here at the end, I can press enter a couple of times, I can write more secrets here, I can delete, I can do anything like that. So this just works like a normal text editor. Now, at the bottom of the page, we see that we do have a couple commands. Now, importantly, this character here, that, the sort of, uh, how would you call that? A hat, I guess. I don't, I don't know what the name for that is. But the hat symbolizes the control key. So if it says hat and O, for example, that would mean control O. So let's say I want to just save this file. Looking at the bottom, we see, okay, so we have control O for write out. So let's pre press control O. It's going to tell us file name to write. So if we want, we can change the file name now and it's going to write it to a different file. But if we just leave it as super underscore text.txt and we press enter, now it has just updated that same file. Now to exit out of this, we don't see it at the bottom. Oh no, we do see it. In the bottom left is control X for exit. So if I press control X, we're out of nano. And if I now do a cat on the file to see if it has in fact changed, the contents of the file have changed. Now in nano, Particularly, notice how if I want to type something in here, so even newer secret, if I try to just exit without saving it, it is going to ask, do we want to save what we've changed? And if we say no, it's just going to quit. If we say yes, it's basically going to give us the same thing as Control O did. It's going to ask us where to save it. And we can just click enter. And now if we do cat on super text again, super secret again, the file has once again changed. So this is the most basic way to edit text files in the terminal. And it operates a lot like what Notepad would. Because Notepad is a graphical app, but for text editing, it doesn't do much graphically. It's still just text that you're editing. So that's how we would edit text files. Now, there are, there are a couple more commands that I'm going to talk about regarding text in particular, which they might not seem that important for right now, but later on we'll see how we can use them in cool ways. So one of the commands, for example, we have a dedicated command for finding out how many words are in a file. So if I do the WC command from word, for, from word count, if I do this on super secret.txt, it's going to give us a couple numbers here at the beginning. So it's going to give us 6, 6, and 58. That's because if you run the word count command, command without any options, it's actually going to output the, what order is this in? So the number of lines, and then the number of words, and then the number of individual characters. It's going to count all of them. So if we look at what was inside the file again, we can see that we do in fact have six lines because there's a new line at the end. That's how files work. So we do have the six lines. We also have this is one big word because it doesn't have any spaces in it. So this is only one word. We have one, two, three, four, five, 
six words, and I'm not going to count the characters, but they would be 58. Now, when it says 58 characters, it doesn't necessarily mean printable characters. So characters that you can see. If you remember when you did, for example, uh, C++ in high school, you might have done like a C out to write to the console. And if you want to have a new line, you might have been taught to use the backslash N. Either that or the end L, because different schools teach differently. But generally speaking, you would use backslash, uh, yeah, backslash N. So backslash N is actually just one character. And that is just the new line character. If you want to write it out from C++, obviously you use two characters to show it to the screen. But the actual new line character is one character. So that's why if we were to try to count the amount of characters in this file, we would probably see there's not 58, there would be like 54 visible ones or something because there is a new line here at the end of this, there is a new line here, there is a new line here, and so on. So those new lines are also counted even though, well, we can see them because we can see they're making new lines, but we can't see a symbol for them, basically. Now, another useful command is the grab command. So grab is going to allow us to search for something in a file and it's gonna, by default, give us the entire line, or actually all of the lines where the text that we are searching on have been found. So for example, if I do a grep on the long secret, which we now know is the B-movie script, and if I look for, uh, let's say, Barry, right? And I'm just typing it in full caps because I think it was in full caps in the original file. If I, uh, wait, um, Code, quotes. yeah, uh, yeah, but I don't know if it's because of the quotes. Yeah, no, uh, I'll, so the reason for this is I think grep actually takes, I didn't look into this, but I think it takes what you're looking for. And then it's something like the F option for the file that it looks into. It's slash I. Okay, so let's talk about how we figure this out because right now I just forgot what option to use. And that's gonna happen a lot when you're working with commands. So if you forget something, how can you look it back up? And more importantly, if you don't know how to use a command in the first place, how can you learn how to use it? So Linux has manual pages built in to the system. So if I wanna see how the grep commands work, because apparently I don't, I can do man from manual, and I can look for grep. And now it's gonna give me the user manual for the grep command. And I can see that it takes, it takes grep, and then the patterns, and then the file. So I should have actually typed that the other way around. So let's see if that works. To quit out of this, we can press Q again. It even says at the bottom, Q to quit. So now let's try grep Betty in the long secret.txt. And now it probably worked, but it didn't actually output anything. That might be because his name might not be Barry. I'm not actually super sure, so let's do a less. Let's look through the file. Okay. And now let's see, what was his name? Oh, he was Barry with an A, not with an E. So that would explain why we can't see it. So now let's do a grab for Barry in the long secret. And now we can see all of the lines where it says Barry. Now, uh, don't get me wrong, it would give us the full line and you can see that it does have like a colon at the end because that's in the original script. The reason why there's nothing after it is because that's how the script is written. If we look into the script again for a second, right? You can see that it would say something like Barry, and then on the new line, it would say what he's saying. If we look, for example, for smaller case Barry, which is how he's spelled when people are actually talking about him, let's try that. Let's grab for Barry in the long secret. Now we can actually see all of the lines where he's being mentioned. 
If we want to see what other options we have, we can once again go into the man page for grab. And if we go down a bit into the page, again with the arrow keys, we can see the options. And here there's everything that it can do. And there's a lot to read if you need it. But most commands are going to always have way more things that you need. So uh, one of the options that we saw there, I actually exited out of it, is this C option. So the C option is from count. We can instead, if we don't want to actually see all of the lines with Barry, we just want to see how many times was he mentioned, then we can do the same thing. So by the way, in the terminal, if you press up arrow, it's going to start going through your history of recently ran commands. And with the down arrow, you go back into the future, let's say. So this is just going back and forth into your command history. If we, go <coughs> if we go back to our previous command, we can now append the C option. And now we'll set it's instead just going to say 251. Because he is the main character, I think. I haven't watched the B movie, I don't know. But I will assume he's the main character because he was mentioned 251 times. OK, so that's some stuff about the grab command. We can also see line numbers, for example, if we want. Again, I don't know how. Let's look into the manual. If we look down into the options, we'll see this output lines prefix control. So we can do a n from line number. So now I can go at the end of this, and I can also add n. Well, actually, I can't do both, because that doesn't make sense. But if I just do n instead, then it's going to print out the, the lines again, but it's going to also tell us the line number where, where we can find it. OK, so that's most of the stuff that I wanted to talk about when it comes to text editing. And text editing is going to be a pretty important thing you're going to want to do in the terminal, because also, it's not like you can edit many other types of files in a terminal without the graphical user interface. Now, just to mention, I say text files. I don't have to mean like .txt files. This is any file that is made out of text. So this can be your Python program. This can be your C++ code. So just anything that is text in general. But for now, let's stop talking a bit about text, because we've done a lot of text stuff. And let's talk about, how do I want to do this? Well, I've noted in the cheat sheet a couple of more, I just call them miscellaneous commands. It's commands that didn't really fit into any particular category, but that they do come in useful, and we'll see why in a second. So the first command, which is maybe the one that's initially going to seem the most useless, is the echo command. So if I type echo, and then I type some text here. So let's type hello there. Now when I press Enter, it's just going to print out hello there. So echo just whatever you wrote, it echoes it back into the terminal. And this might not sound useful. We'll see a bit later how we can use this in some fun ways. Now, another few things. So I've mentioned the ping command early on. This is on Windows as well. The pin command, technically, it checks if you can connect to a specific server. So you can say, hey, can I, for example, reach google.com? And if I run this command, it's going to start sending requests to Google. And we're going to see that it responds and in how long it responds. So this is the time it took for it to respond. Quite often, you just use this to check if your internet is working or not, because you would just ping a service that you know is always available, like Google or something, and you check if your internet is working. But now, interestingly, we've run into this thing where this program is now going to run forever. And we don't yet know how to stop it. So far, we've quit out of programs using Q. I don't think Q works here. No, it does. So if I type Q, it's just going to ignore me. And it's going to keep running forever. So almost any program that is running in the terminal can be stopped using the Control-C command. So if I press Control-C, 
now it's going to finish and it's going to give us the results of what happened, right? So the ping command wasn't particularly important, but what is important is to know the control C command because that's also what you're going to need if a program freezes up or something and you need to close it. That's usually going to be with control C as well. Now, another cool utility that we have in terminal is the top command. Top is going to give us a process manager. So let's make the terminal full screen so that we can see easier what we're doing. If we run top, it's going to give us this fairly scary interface. But uh, are you all familiar with the task manager in Windows? In reality, this looks a bit scary because it's just text, but it gives us the same information that the task manager would. So it's giving us a list of all of the running processes and it's telling us which user ran, ran it, how much memory it takes, how much CPU it consumes, and stuff like that. And uh, in, the right sand, uh, in the right side, the command, this is the actual program that it's running, basically. Now, on most distributions, is, uh, to quit out of this, we can use Q. On most distributions, instead of top, you will also have htop installed. I don't know if I have it here. I don't have it in here. It's telling me how I can install it, but we'll talk about installing software in a second. Well, actually, that's kind of where we are right now. So let's do talk about how we install software. So it's going to give us here, it's going to tell us intuitively, command htop not found, but it can be installed using these. So you might notice it's giving us two separate commands that we can use. One of them is a snap command. The other one is an apt command. So we've talked twice already about the different ways to install software. All of these apply in the terminal as well. So snap would be the universal package manager that we talked about a bit. And then apt is the package manager given to us by our distribution. Now, one interesting thing is, notice how these commands before apt, they say sudo. So, uh, first of all, sudo comes from like sup, uh, yeah, super user do. So you're telling the computer to do something as the super user. Super user is what on Windows is called the administrator. So on Windows, if you install an application, you're usually, it gives you a prompt to confirm that you're an admin and you have to click yes. On Linux, we've seen last time that when we installed an application using the software center that we've used, it asked us for our password for the same reason, to gain admin rights. In the terminal, it's not going to ask us for the password. If I try to do apt install htop, it's just going to tell us that it can't do it because it doesn't have the permissions to do that. We have to run this as administrator. So prepending sudo to any command is going to say, hey, run the following command as an administrator, as the super user. So we're going to do a sudo apt install htop. And this time, it's going to ask us for a password. This is because we use sudo. We have to give our password. I'm going to type it in. It's automatically not going to show it. So I did type it in, but it doesn't print it out so that you can't get any information about how long it is or what it is or stuff like that. It's not going to type anything. But now if I press Enter, now this is actually running. And it put a lot of stuff on the screen. We don't need to care about it. But basically, now it installed it. And now we've installed our first application using the terminal. In a lot of ways, once you do get more used to Linux, and especially if you start knowing the package name for something, this is usually just faster to do than having to go to the software center. It does the same thing behind the scenes. But the software center is just slow because you have to open the application, search for it, wait for it to search through all the packages, find the correct one, click install. It just takes a little bit more time. If you already know the exact name for the application you want to install, usually quicker to just do it through the terminal. Now that we have htop, we can run the htop command. And we can see that it is doing the same thing as top. It's just a bit better structured. But this is the same information that top gave us. OK, and to quit out of this, we can press Q. So now that we've started to get a little bit into software management, 
Let's talk about the other commands that apt gives us, apt gives us. So, first of all, one of the, all of the apt commands will need to be run with sudo because it needs admin rights to run. One of the most important commands is going to be sudo apt update. So the update command is not actually going to update your applications that you have installed. The update command is just going to look once again through its entire database of applications that it has. And it's going to see what are the newest versions for all of them. So this is going to be used to check what applications can I then actually update. So if we run this, let's see, I hope I have some updates. It's going to go through all of the repositories that are configured by Ubuntu. So you can see at the end, Ubuntu. And it's going to tell us 34 packages can be upgraded. Run apt list upgradable to see them. So first of all, if we care, we can do that. We can do a sudo apt list upgradable. And now it's going to just print out all of the different packages that we have installed that have a newer version available for them. If we don't really care and we just want to upgrade all of them, we can just do a sudo apt upgrade. And now this is going, to, is going to show us the following packages will be upgraded. And it gives us a full list. This is the same list of applications we saw above. And if I press enter, now it's just going to automatically download all of those applications at the newest version. So this is one of the advantages that I don't actually know if I've mentioned before in the way Linux handles software compared to how Windows does it. On Windows, there is no universal way for an app to automatically update. So some apps will just not automatically update at all. And if you want a newer version, you go download it yourself. Other applications will have their own auto updaters. So for example, Discord. You know how if you open Discord on Windows, the first thing it does is it does an update check. And if you have updates, it automatically updates itself. Some applications will do that. And other applications will do this middle ground where they will just check for new updates. And when you open the application, it will say, there is a new version available. And they're going to give you a link to the download page. And you just have to reinstall it yourself. So on Linux, because all of the uh, software you install, you install through your package manager, it can manage all of the updates universally. So any app that you've installed through APT, if you do a sudo apt upgrade, all of them are going to be put at the newer, newest version available. The one uh, caveat here, I guess, is obviously each package manager is going to handle their, their own software. So we've talked about how we have a choice. We can install stuff through apt. We can install stuff to, through fa Flatpak or through Snap or stuff like that. We have multiple package managers. Each one of them, when we run their own respective version of the upgrade command, they might be called differently, but they're all going to upgrade their own packages up to the newest version. OK, so for APT, we have these two very important commands, the update and the upgrade command. Now, what if I want to install a new application? Well, first of all, we've seen how to install an application if we know its exact name. So we want to install htop. We did sudo apt install htop, and it gave us htop. So that just worked. But now, what if we want to install something that we don't know the exact name of it, or maybe we're not sure, right? So let's say I want to install, what can I get? Um, Let's get NeoVim. NeoVim is a text editor. We don't need to know about what it is. It's just something I want to install right now. What we can do is we can do a sudo apt search, and I can search for NeoVim. And it's going to search through its entire thing, and it's going to give us all of the packages that have NeoVim in their name. And we can see that there is one here that is just called NeoVim, and that is the one that I want. So now that I know its exact name, it is NeoVim, I can now do the app, uh, wait, sorry, apt install NeoVim, because I know its name. And now if I run it, 
it's going to ask me for confirmation. Hey, do I actually want to install this? Notice how I said before that the package manager is also going to install anything else we need to get the application running. So all of its dependencies, it's actually going to tell this here. So it tells us the following new packages will be installed. And we can say that even though I only told it to install NeoVim, this one there, it's actually going to install what? Uh, 12 software, 12 programs. Because NeoVim needs all of the other 11 programs to actually run. So now I can confirm that I do want to install all of these. It's also going to tell us how much space it takes. And now it's going to automatically download all of those 11 packages. And I have NeoVim. So the command for NeoVim is actually not NeoVim, it's NVim. But if I run it, I am now in NVim. NVim is another text editor. It's a more advanced text editor that we don't necessarily need to talk about right now. But I just wanted to show how I can both search for it and then install it. Now, I no longer like NeoVim. What if I want to remove it? So to uninstall a program, apt has the I think on APT, yeah. on APT, it's remove. I can do remove NeoVim, and it's automatically going to tell us that it's going to remove one package. So this is interesting, because remember how we installed 12 packages to get NeoVim working. But now when, when we're uninstalling NeoVim, it's only uninstalling this one package. If we click Confirm, and it removes NeoVim, it will tell us at the end, I think. Oh, no, it, it told us here, actually, already in the command. It told us the following packages were automatically installed and are no longer required. So those are all of the applications that it installed to get NeoVim working. And the package manager automatically realizes these are no longer needed on your system. You can keep them if you're using them for some reason, but no software actually depends on them anymore. So we can use the sudo apt auto remove command, and that is just going to delete anything that was automatically installed and that is no longer required. So that helps clean up the system a bit. If I do a apt auto remove, now it's actually removing 11 packages. From the 12, we remove new of them, and now we're removing the other 11. And now it's like nothing happened. So that's how, that's how we do most of the basic stuff with apt. That's how we search for apps, we install them, we remove them, stuff like that. The other thing is, remember how when I did an update, so let's do an update again. We can see this list of repositories here, this list of links of where is it going to look for software in, right? So these are all of the repositories where we can download applications from. APT and many other package managers actually allow us to edit this file. We can remove any of these sources if we want, and more importantly, we can add any sources we want. So I don't have a source on hand right now to demonstrate this, but you can run the apt edit sources command and that is just automatically going to ask us, hey, with which editor do you want to do this with? And we'll choose Nano. And it's going to open us this text file that is given to us by our distribution. The only important part about it is we can see all of the uh, links that were being called. So this is the, the links that we use, right? And if we go to the bottom of it, we could just or if we go anywhere, actually, we could here add our own source, whatever we want. So blah, blah, blah. I don't have a source to show. But you can change your sources in here. And then when it's going to search for new software, it's going to look in there as well, not only in the sources given to you by your distribution. So you can customize this a bit. OK, now I want to exit, so Control X. And I don't want to actually save this buffer because I just typed some random things in there. So I can press No. And now it's like nothing happened to that file. Now, the other main package manager that we talked about was Flatpak. 
I'm not going to go through all of the commands again because they are generally the same. So you have, uh, we had flatpak install, which is the same as apt install. We have flatpak, re uh, well, flatpak uninstall actually, instead of flatpak install, uh, flatpak remove. They just call it different things. But um, one important difference is the flatpak update command. So on apt, we did an update to check for newer versions. And then we did an upgrade to actually install those newer versions. Flatpak does this all in one. So the flatpak update command is automatically going to both look for new updates and say nothing to do. If it found any new updates, it would also install them with the same command. Now, notice how I didn't have to type sudo for this. Flatpak does not run as an administrator. And this is because we talked about how it has some enhanced security features. I'm not going to go into exactly what those are, maybe in a different meeting. But uh, those files, those programs are just installed in the current user. So you don't need admin permissions to install anything from Flatpak. Now, if we type Flatpak remotes, this is the same thing as the sources we saw from APT. If we just type remote, it's going to list them out. We can see that we have Flathub. Because last time, if you remember, in Discover, I clicked the Enable Flathub button. And it just added it. I can do a flat, flat pack remote add. And I can add any remote I want. I don't have any remotes, once again. I can also do a remote. Is it remove or delete? It's remote delete. And I can delete anything. So I could, for example, delete flat hub here. But I don't want it right now. Now, for we have saw that once we've installed an application from apt, because it's installed in the entire system, we can just call it from the command line, like I did with NeoVim a second ago. Now, if I remember correctly, if nothing's changed since the last time I've used this, this doesn't work quite the same with Flatpak. So if we open an application from the start menu, right, in a graphical way, uh, we can see that they are all the same. So whether I open something like LibreOffice, which is installed natively, like with apt, or if I wanted to open Bottles, which we installed last time through Flatpak, it's available here. They look the same. But now if I go into my terminal and I type bottles, I don't think that's going to work. Yeah. So bottles is not installed as far as it's concerned. Applications that are installed through Flatpak, because of all of the security stuff going around it, do have to be opened through Flatpak, Flatpak as well. So if I instead would do a Flatpak run bottles, uh, yeah, you have to know the full package name of it. OK, so let's see that. If we do Flatpak list, it's going to list all of the apps that we've installed through Flatpak. So through these, we see that we have installed Spotify, and we have installed Bottles. right? Now, to actually run an application, if you want to do it through the terminal, most Flatpak stuff you would do through the Start menu. But if you, for some reason, want to open a Flatpak app through the terminal, you do need to know its actual application ID, so the second column. So if I do a Flatpak run, and it's com.usebottles.bottles, now we give it a second, and Bottles opens up. OK? So that's how a lot of the Flatpak stuff works. And I think I have covered everything with Flatpak. Do you have anything else interesting? Oh, so you, uh, the same thing as last time, you can search. So I can do a flat pack search, and let's get a, let's look for bottles, even though I do have it installed. You can see that it has found it. So flat pack search bottles, and it found the bottles one. It gives us the description, its application ID, and version, as well as remotes, so where it's going to install it from. So this is the same as with the app search. You can just search for apps in the repositories. Okay.
Now, just a couple more important concepts about the terminal. So, so far, we haven't really thought about necessarily how input and output works. We're typing stuff with the keyboard, and that works. And then it's printing stuff back out to the terminal, and that works, right? Well, there's a concept called the standard input and the standard output. That's basically the default place where applications will take their input from and where they will put their output to, basically. So, standard input, when you are in a terminal, that's going to be your keyboard. That's the standard input. So anything that I type, I put into the standard input, and then when I press enter, that gets sent to the computer. Now I typed some nothingness, so it's going to tell me command not found. Now, this command not found, this came through the standard output, which because I'm in a terminal, that's going to be on my screen. That's going to be on a terminal. Now, the reason this is important is because we can play with this a bit. So, there is one concept called pipes in Linux. We can basically take anything from standard output and pipe it back into standard input. This would be useful, for example, for transferring uh, for sort of, yeah, transferring information from one program to another one. So, I've told you before, we talked about the echo command, right? But I said it doesn't look that useful. Let's think about what it actually does now. So the echo command is going to take something that we write here, and it's going to output it to the standard output. That's the reason we can see it on the screen. Now, a lot of commands, for example, the word count command that we talked about before, can use information from the standard input. So, one thing that I could do is I could say echo test, right? And I could say, now, the standard output of this, pipe it, so this is the pipe operator, and now I can write a different command after it. So let's type wc, word count. So this is gonna, the echo command is gonna put test in the standard output. Because of the pipe, that standard output will go back into standard input as if we wrote it on the keyboard. And then that is gonna be interpreted by word count. And if we run this, we get the results 115. Again, it's one line, one word, five characters. I know it's four characters. As I said, there's a new line at the end. That's why it appears that way. So this is one of the useful context, context, uh, concepts called piping, right? You can pipe the output of any program into a different program. Another useful concept is redirecting, which sounds similar because it does almost the same thing. But instead of taking standard output and piping it back into standard input, it just writes it into a file. So let's say I want to echo test, right? So again, I'm putting test onto the standard output. I can now redirect it. That is done through the greater than sign. And I can redirect it into test.txt, for example. And now if I run this, test didn't appear in the console anymore. So it was no longer written to standard output. Instead, it's now being written to a file. If I do an ls to see what files I have, I do in fact have a test.txt file, which was newly created. And if I do a cat on it to see what is inside of it, I have test. So the output of any program, if you don't want to see it right now, but maybe you want to see it later, you want to log it to have later access to it, you can redirect it to any file on the system. Okay? Uh, thankfully, these were all of the major concepts that I wanted to go through, which is very good because we have five minutes left. 
Time passed a bit faster than I expected, but I did manage to get through everything. This cheat sheet will be available once again, and it covers in lesser detail basically everything I've covered today. Now, some final announcements, because this was the last meeting with me for the introduction to Linux trilogy, I guess. So, first of all, the, these meetings, the CTF meetups, are continuing. I will no longer be the presenter, but starting next week, do we know what happens next week or do we not know what happens next week yet? Same room, same time. Same room, same time. So ne next week in the same room at the same time, there will be someone else talking about someone else. So this project goes on for the rest of the semester. As far as me and Alex are concerned, we are, uh, we are done with presenting here. We no longer have scheduled time here. But we will be hosting two more online meetings for those interesting. So I will be hosting a sort of a, let's call it a troubleshooting meeting. So I'm not going to be presenting anything per se, but if anyone is curious to try out Linux and tries installing it and tries using it and maybe runs into some problems or doesn't understand how to do something, I will schedule at some point a couple of hours where you can just ask me any questions. Alex will schedule his deep dive into Linux. For those that are curious to learn more about how all of these things actually work, because I explained this at a very high level, skipping over a bunch of stuff. If you want to know how these things actually work better behind the scenes, Alex will hold an online meeting. For, for those who want to pass operating systems class? Yeah, it will definitely be very helpful for passing the operating systems class next year. So that is another thing that we'll be holding. Now, uh, to sign up to these, I have prepared a QR code. Have I put the QR code on the laptop? No. So let's, let's figure out a quick way to fix this situation. While he manages the QR code, uh, one interesting thing that you might have noticed when you have updated all the apps, it also updated the system. If you are paying attention in the list, it uh, said Linux too. Uh, compared to Windows, where it just bothers you at every reboot that no, we, we need to update the system. You can update it anytime you want and you can use it while it updates. It's not going to bother you with any reboot. You reboot it when you have time, if you have time. Linux is stable, you can run it for days without shutting it down. So you don't really have a pressure to restart your computer. Yeah, and another cool side effect of what Alex mentioned is, well, not necessarily a side effect, but a mental switch from Windows to Linux is, on Windows you have this clear separation of your applications that you have installed and your operating system. But as we talked about last time, the operating system is actually just a uh, collection of applications. Those applications on Linux are actually just managed by your package manager, in our case, Aptitude. So when you run apt, it's not only going to update um, I'm gonna do this. It's not only going to update the apps that you've installed, it's also going to update anything pre-installed with the operating system. OK, so. I managed to get the. Yeah, you can also use the operating system while it's updating, unlike Windows. So, this is the QR code. If you want to scan this really quickly, um, and you basically you'll be asked to optionally give us your email address so that we can let you know when the future meetings are going to happen. With that being said, do we have any questions for what happened today? If not, then, oh. I might have a question. So what do you, do? <coughs> sorry, what do you think that Dutch is not a good name for the command names? I'm not saying it's not a good name, but I, say, I think it's less intuitive than RM from remove or stuff like that. But I mean, if we are moving, touching, copying, we are um, moving, opening, closing, objects, I mean, we can touch it, kind of touch a file, it's like we just touch it. Yeah. yeah. M maybe just to me it's not intuitive, I don't know. Yeah, I find it. Uh, so the main purpose of touch 
It's not the same to change the time sample of last access. Yeah, yeah fair. Creating a new file is just the same. Yeah, fair. OK, has everyone scanned? OK, in that case, thank you everyone for coming. And I'll see you online, hopefully. OK, now we need to pack up because the next, the next professor after us is not very kind. So we need to get out of here fast. <laughs>